Hey everyone, welcome to Pastor's Perspective. I'm your host, Dr. Doug Hamp, and I've got my brother Ed Doss with me. Hey Ed, great to see you, man. Hey, we've got some questions already in the chat, so I'd say let's get right into them. I'm excited about getting into some of these questions. First one is from Mark J. He says, in Leviticus 3.17, it says we should never eat fat or blood. Is this speaking about the fat and blood of sacrifices, or should we abstain from fat completely? For example, the fat on a steak or roast. I don't know. What do you think about that, Ed? I think it is applicable to those animals that are being sacrificed. Okay. The fat and the blood are very important. Yes. Um, sacrificial process, and that's what I believe is going on there. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, it says here, this should be a statute throughout generations. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. Now, what's interesting is that blood is mentioned all over the place, right? You should not eat the blood because the life is in the blood. All right. So that one, I think, is 100 percent crystal clear that we're not to do that. Now, the question about a steak, this is where some people get a little bit off. They think that the red stuff that you see on a steak is actually hemoglobin. It's not. It's actually called myoglobin. Um, and it's basically a red liquid, but it's not hemoglobin. Okay, so it's not blood. It's not the stuff coming out of the veins, uh, but it's, you know, some other kind of substance. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, you know, personally, I don't like eating fat. So for me, it's not a problem to cut that fat off at all. Um, but I think you do have a point there, Ed, that, you know, this is the fat that is supposed to be offered to the Lord. Now, since we're not doing these sacrifices unto the Lord, I mean, we're slaughtering animals and we're eating them. And sometimes part of the fat of the animal is in our meal. Uh, it, it, it's not something that's being given to the Lord for the Lord uh, as some kind of a sacrifice on behalf of sin and sinners. So probably that's what's going on in that passage is that it's speaking specifically about people that are bringing a sacrifice to the Lord uh, for a covering for their sins. Yeah, because there's no possible way to not eat fat in the animals that we consume. If I want a ribeye steak, you, you may cut away the fat that's on the edges, but a ribeye steak has fat marbled into it. And mm -hmm. so how are you going to ensure that all that fat is gone? No, that's, that's not the case. Right. I definitely believe it's a matter of uh, sacrifice. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah, very good. Okay, uh, next question uh, from Katie. She says, uh, Dr. Hamp, I watched a video today where you mentioned you used to be a pre-trib believer. Where do you stand on the timing of the rapture now and why? What specifically caused you to change your opinion on this topic? Well, Katie, um, you know, when it comes to the pre-trib rapture, it's nowhere in scripture and don't take my word for it. You can listen to Hal Lindsey. You can listen to uh, Tim LaHaye. You know, like these are probably some of the biggest names in the pre-trib that will say that it's all by inference. There's nothing specifically in the text. And I grew up as a pre-tribber. I thought was the, <clears throat> thought it was the best doctrine ever. <laughs> Until I just, I could not find it in scripture. I, you know, there are all these allusions to it and shadows of it. And, and, you know, that's fine. But shadows are cast by what? They're cast by a thing, right? You know, if there's a tree, a then it cast a shadow. You know, if you've been out, you know, later in the day, then you cast a shadow. That's because you are there. All right. So if your shadow is there and you're not there, well, there's a real problem. Okay. And so what happens is people are looking for these shadows, but they're never finding the substance, right? So again, shadows are fine, but only if they have substance, right? So we that's what I started looking for. I'm like, where is the substance? And when it came to this question, I could not find it. I used to hang out and speak at uh, a lot of pre-trib rapture conferences, and I could not find it. I asked people that were also speaking there. I'm like, where is the best verse for the preacher rapture? And they looked at me like I had, you know, <laughs> like I had, you know, committed some grievous sin. 
um, that, uh, you know, I might never get over. It was the, it was almost like it was the blasphemy of the Holy spirit or something, you know, <laughs> that Which I was funny in and of itself, yeah. right? Because, uh, in, in many religious circles, many Christian religious circles, there are some, it's weird. There are some questions that are just, like you said, if you ask them, it, it just gets all kinds of, um, weird reactions almost as if you're not allowed to ask that question yeah i've had that happen to me twice in my life i don't mean to get off topic here a little bit but uh i remember um talking to a pastor when i was very young like 19 20 21 years old 20 years old about this whole idea of discipleship in the bible and this was back when churches discovering the idea the teaching of discipleship was relatively new and uh and he gave me that serious look and told me that that idea comes straight from the pit of hell <laughs> wow and the same thing happened wow. when i began my journey on torah this this these questions that are just off limits i don't mean to sidetrack the question here i just couldn't help but respond to what you said Doug. no it's to it's totally fine because you know again we want scripture to be the litmus test. That is what we're using to determine what we believe to be true and what we think is not true. So, you know, if the pre trib rapture were in scripture, great. I mean, I'm happy to get zapped out of here before it gets ugly. I'm totally chill with that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if I can't find such a doctrine in scripture and I can find a bunch of scriptures to the contrary, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of scriptures that talk about the gathering of God's people after the tribulation, then maybe I should, you know, sit up and take notice. So that's eventually what I decided to do. It was not easy, but I think it was the right choice. So, um, okay. She has another question. I've heard a few people mentioning that tithing is not a new Testament requirement. What are your thoughts? Yes. I noticed that this might be the, uh, Katie show. Uh, she's <laughs> a lot of questions, which is yes. fine. It, it gives us something to talk about. So, yeah, proper tithing, biblical tithing requires Levitical priesthood. It requires the temple. And so, yes, you do see biblical tithing in the New Testament because the temple wasn't destroyed until 70 AD. And so uh, Yeshua taught, taught about taking our required, when he, when he healed the man, he told them to take your required giving to the temple. Uh, we see the the widow in, in the New, New Testament. But can we today, without the temple, without a priesthood, can we properly tithe as we see in the Old Testament? And we can't. We can't do it the way it's laid out in the Old Testament. Does that mean we shouldn't give? Or does that mean that we can't give? No, to the contrary. The New Testament is replete with challenges to be giving, mm -hmm. uh, be giving people. So we can give. Yeah. Uh, does that mean you have to give to a church? I used to believe that. I used to believe that I'm not giving to God unless I'm giving to a church. And this that's not just, that's not true. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of different ways that you can give uh, to, to people and support people around the world with your funds. It doesn't right. have to be to a church. What do you think on that one? No, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I mean, church is OK, but it doesn't have to be a church. Uh, I'm maybe a little biased here, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, I would argue the same that you don't have to give to a church. Um, you know, the principle of tithing is, well, let's think about what the priests did. Obviously, they did sacrifices. OK, so that's not happening today, but they did more than that. You know, they really rallied the people. They helped people understand God. They were. Um, people that would, um, you know, help expound on the law and a whole host of things that they were doing beyond the sacrifices. They were also your public servants that were operating within the gates of the city as judges quite often uh, and other jobs that they held. So, you know, there was a need to support these people. They were not freeloaders. They, you know, they definitely earned their keep um in, in very different ways and so you know i think that that principle of tithing still exists and you get to choose right you know if it's a a local ministry i would definitely say give there but you can also give 
you know, uh, in, in different ways. You can give to charities, you can give to, uh, you know, if somebody's in need, you can give that way, you know, somebody like a friend, you know, it doesn't always have to be a, an organization necessarily. So there's lots of opportunities. And, you know, and I think God is giving us some great principles in scripture to, to give 10% and maybe go beyond that, you know, give, uh, give in different ways and see if the blessing doesn't come. So yeah, very good. Um, another question from Katie, uh, Revelation 22, 2, who are the nations and why do they need healing? Right. Well, that is something that I pondered for a very long time. All right. So Revelation 22, 2, I'll just pull that up here on the screen here. It says, and he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and from of the lamb in the middle of its street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. All right. So this perplexed me for a very long time. Because I was raised in the general dispensational model that holds that we're going to have uh, the millennium. And then after the millennium, God's going to destroy the earth or it gets blown up or something. And then this brand new one comes. But what I began to realize is the book of Revelation is not laid out chronologically, principally speaking, but it is laid out thematically. So Revelation, tw uh, Revelation 20 is talking about the millennium okay that's the thousand year period and it's talking about key events in the millennium namely satan's put away and the resurrection happens then at the end of the millennium he gets out there's a final rebellion boom okay and people are judged chapter 20 what is it all about it's not about so much an event as it is a place okay that place being the new jerusalem where is that new jerusalem in time it's in the millennium how do i know that because it says that satan and all the nations are going to come and they're going to surround the beloved city what is the beloved city it's the new jerusalem okay now chapter 22 now it's giving some details about what is in that new jerusalem and, and sort of what are the functions of this well there's a river of life coming from the throne of god and there are trees on either side of this river whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. Now, if you need to be healed, what does that presuppose? Well, that you're sick, right? So if you're sick, you need to be healed. Now, if this were happening in the eternal state when death had been done away with, there would be no need for healing because everyone's already healed. So this means that this has to be in conjunction with the millennium now not only that but let's take a look at the uh the parallel passage okay because the parallel passage is in uh ezekiel let's see uh usually i have my little shortcuts here but i had to get a new computer and they're not showing up but it doesn't matter so in ezekiel chapter uh 40 what is it 47 yeah so uh, here you have a river. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east and toward the front and all this different stuff, right? And so we have all this. Now, when I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows from the eastern gate, et cetera, et cetera. And when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed, okay? And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. There will be a great multitude of fish because these waters will go there and they will be healed. Everything will live wherever the river goes. Okay. So, and then he says, uh, talking about these trees, their food will be for food. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. Okay. We see that. So because the leaves are for medicine, it's the same thing. Healed medicine, the same thing. So this is happening during the millennium. The tree of life, which will be on either side of the river of life, will have leaves that whose, um, you know, the leaves which are for the healing of the nations. Now, where else was there a tree of life? It was in the Garden of Eden, right? So in the Garden of Eden was the tree of life. And 
when Adam sinned, what did God say? Uh oh, now lest Adam stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and live forever, right? And so he cast him out of the garden. So the tree of life has the ability to change a person from mortal to immortal. All right, now, why did God not let Adam eat from that tree? Because he was now tainted with corruption. So he would have been eternally or immortally corrupted. That's not a good thing. And that's essentially what the fallen angels are. They're immortal beings, but they're corrupted. So they're forever corrupted. They cannot be healed. They cannot be transformed because the mechanism to do that is the tree of life. And if you take the tree of life without first taking of the river of life, well, you're kind of messed up. <laughs> okay. So the pe people are going to come to the new Jerusalem during the millennium and they'll be clean, cleansed, right? It says in Zechariah 13, there will be a river um, for the healing of the nations or for the cleansing of the nations. And that's how you get, you get cleansed first from the river of life. And then you take the leaves of the tree of life and then you live forever. So that is how it all comes together. All right. Uh, Katie's got another question. Uh, just listen to your CERN video, just discussing Jesus stopping the storm on the sea of Galilee. And that you think Satan was the one who brought the storm. If Satan had dominion over the earth at that time, how is Jesus allowed to intervene? What does having dominion allow and not allow them? Well, Katie, uh, we see that Satan uh, had dominion over the earth in the days of Job, right? And so Job's kids uh, were feasting and then a great wind came and it blew the house down. That was brought about by Satan, right? So we know that he has that. So basically, think of it this way. You know, Satan had a lot of power, still does. Um, but, you know, so his power hasn't changed. It was about authority. The, the, the contest between Jesus and Satan was not about who had the more power. Jesus has way more power. Okay. Hands down, he's unlimited. Satan has a lot of power for sure. But Jesus has unlimited power and there's no contest. So what was the issue? It wasn't power. It was authority. And Satan did have authority over the earth. It was forfeited when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit and they were, um, well, they, they were fell into death, right? And so when that happened, then the authority, the dominion over the earth fell into Satan's hands. So Jesus came to purchase back, to redeem the planet from that authority that Satan uh, had acquired. All right. So um, so that's, that's essentially uh, what's going on there. All right. Um, and, you know, kind of a follow-up question, uh, will they give that back? I, I think they will, because we see in Revelation chapter 6 that, that um, death and Hades had authority over the earth, right? So where do they get that? Are they getting it from God? I don't think so. I think that they are going to get it from humanity who will essentially say, we're going to give you this. How do I know that? Well, Isaiah chapter 28, woe to you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. For you say, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol. We're in agreement. Sheol, Hades, same thing. So uh, certainly people in Jerusalem and the rest of the world are going to make a covenant with death and think that they're getting a really sweet deal. Paul talks about that as well in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So you know, it's going to be delusional, to be clear, <laughs> to be very delusional. But, you know, that's what delusions are all about, is that they make sense at the time until you step back and you're like, yeah, it doesn't make too much sense. <laughs> all right. Diana asks, how did Pharaoh's daughter find out who Moses' real mother was? She had his real mother nurse him until he was weaned. How did she know? Um, Brother Ed, any, any thoughts uh, you want to add on that? Uh, yeah, we can read it. It was Miriam, um, Exodus two, I believe it was Miriam mm -hmm. that, um, was the, the culprit, so to speak, or the answer to your question. Pull that up, Doug. <clears throat> um, yeah. Exodus so, two. Got it. That's in the old Testament. <laughs> Thanks brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. 
So uh, there it starts off by saying he was born, he was a beautiful child. She put the uh, child in the, uh, the Ark of the Bulrushes. Uh, and then down in verse 7, his yeah. sister, who's his sister? That's Miriam, mm -hmm. Moses' sister, uh, said, should I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter uh, said, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Now, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Miriam intervened um, and, and got his actual mother to wean the child. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Good. Well, that was quick and easy. Quick and easy. We like this. All right. Uh, how were the Neph how were their Nephilim before and after the flood? Did they not die oh, in the flood? Or did the watchers repeat the sin of making Nephilim again after the flood? <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> you want to handle this one? <laughs> well, I can handle it. Um, Doug and I have different opinions on this issue. No, go for it, man. You, you uh, speak first. That's okay. Uh, it's okay to have different opinions. Yeah. I, I did a video on this for a pretty in-depth teaching on an, on an old channel of mine. Um, if, if you guys want it, you can put it, your question or ask for it in the comments and I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, there's two possibilities floating out there. One possibility is that there was a second fall. Uh, where the angels did what they did in Genesis 6 twice, or at least twice. Um, the second idea is that although um, Noah and his sons were pure, as in DNA, his, their wives probably weren't. Their wives were probably carriers, to some degree, of the infected human genome. And so when we get on the other side of the flood, you begin to see in Ham's and Japheth's line, these Nephilim begin to show up more so in Ham. And I think that's part and parcel as a result of the curse that was placed on Ham's descendants. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, on Ham's descendants. So we see them pretty strongly in Ham's line. Uh, you see a few in Japheth's line. You see none in Shem's because that's Yeshua's line, right? Um, so those are the two possibilities. Now, the scriptures do not support either of them outright. We can't turn to a passage and say, here, here's where it says, this is how the Nephilim ended up on the other side of the flood. Uh, my idea, my what I put forth is, a guess is the is the best guess. Doug's is also a best guess because we can't again we can't turn to a verse that says there was a second fall. So mm -hmm. the second the second reason I think that is because post flood, the uh, the size of the nephilim began to diminish uh, because of the weakened DNA from one generation to another. Uh, and, you know, Amos says they were big as as, um, as trees, but by the time we get to David, they're nine to thirteen feet tall with Goliath and his brothers, mm -hmm. and so they kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So, yeah. at the end of the day, does it does that really matter? No. If you want to be in Doug's camp, Amen. If you want to be in my <laughs> camp, Amen. No difference to me. Those, yeah. those are the two bigger, biggest ideas. Is that would you agree, Doug? Yeah, I mean, you know, we certainly can have differences of opinion. That's fine. I take a more nuanced approach in Cryptic Image Volume Two, where I suggest that Satan had a uh, personal encounter with Nimrod, or vice versa, you might say. Uh, I think, you know, and I'm I'm reconstructing this based on uh, what I know from ancient history. I think Satan came and made a deal an offer to, to Nimrod to become the rebel uh, and that he would overshadow him, impart his DNA into him, and that Nimrod would then, then become a god, a demigod. And then he gave his DNA to others, such as the Amorites, and they, uh, became, they were involved in some kind of iniquity that was in progress when God made a promise to Abraham. So 
um, because he says that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So I think they were up to no good. Um, so, so that's how I would suggest that it happened after the flood. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't it doesn't really change too much. But but that's how uh, I tend to see it, and how I would try to reconcile uh, those particular verses. So awesome. Um, all right, we've got another question here. This is from Katie. Is it from Katie? <laughs> it's from Katie. Yeah, she says, uh, I know Jesus says men and women will not be given in marriage in heaven. But what I'm trying to reconcile is why God would have established such a union in Eden, paradise. If marriage or a union between a man and woman or some kind wasn't how he initially wanted things to be. It seems like all of God's plans since the fall have been, been about restoring the original vision of Eden to its entirety. There is no plan B or plan A. It's always been the plan. It seems that God is determined to have his sovereign vision come to fruition. Thoughts? Um, I, I, that's, I don't know. That's a tricky one. I mean, you know, that that is pretty hard to reconcile uh, I suspect that by the time we are at the Lord's right hand that says that there are pleasures forevermore, um, we may not be looking back <laughs> toward uh, this, this, you know, reality that, that we're aware of. So, but I don't know. I just don't know that we have any particular way to really dig deeper on that one. So, um, so anyway. I toss in two cents there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and guess his conjecture partly conjecture, but in paradise, in creation, Katie, their role as humanity was to subdue and rule the earth. That was the intended uh, goal of humanity in the garden. God said Adam needed a wife. And by the way, that stands true today. I need my wife for so many things. Um, and I couldn't do what I do without her. Uh, and I think that's just the way God created us first and foremost. However, in the new paradise, when Yeshua returns, he will not be ruling. Man will not be ruling. Uh, it'll be God who, who rules. Mm. Yeshua will you know, be ruling. Uh, and so that role will change in the new paradise. That's mm -hmm. just my two cents on that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, uh, we have a question from Ed Doss. What do you know? <laughs> That's <Hey>. interesting. <laughs> Let me give okay. the background on this question really fast. Yeah, uh, go for it. Uh, over the weekend, I taught a, uh, a lesson, um, and we were talking about uh, uh, a prophet like you. We were going into the details about how Yeshua uh, really, really fulfilled in so many detailed ways that prophecy from Deuteronomy that a prophet like Moses would come. And we looked at all the, the, the whole litany of different things. One of the things that, that I proposed was that the reason Yeshua turned the, uh, the, the, his first miracle, his first public miracle was water to wine was because he was the prophet uh, like Moses who in his, his first public uh, miracle was turning the Nile river to blood. So now we can read the question. Um, so we have a, a bit of a background here. Go ahead. All right. So I will uh, read the question here for us, which um, is that Oops, in John that. 2, Yeshua says, my hour has not yet come, which leads the reader to believe that this hour that Jesus spoke of was reserved for some future event. If so, which hour did he intend? And more importantly, did his mother being persistent Determine the hour early. In addition, I contend that this miracle of turning water to wine is directly connected to the fact that Moses' first public miracle was turning water to blood, and Yeshua was to be the prophet that would be just like Moses. Thus, this first public miracle was a nod to his true identity. So, awesome. I, I um, muted myself there. So, my, my wife then, after that lesson was over, posed that question as to uh, whether or not that really was uh, a nod to his identity as a prophet like Moses, if Mary had forced the issue. Because hmm. he said, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And she kind of forced the issue. So I thought it was kind of a, an enigmatic question that I thought it would be fun to, uh, to bring up here and see what your thoughts are. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a, a really interesting 
uh, parallel, and I think it very well could be. Um, you know, I I think another way you could just look at it is that God is in the fellowship. Wine is all about fellowship, and that uh, you know He wanted to establish that one of the first things He was doing was establishing fellowship. So you know, obviously the red part of those liquids is uh, is, is what we have in common. But I guess that's where I would see that it, it ends. So I'm not saying it's wrong. I just, you know, I don't think that's the necessarily the only interpretation, but I think it's a, a very interesting one. And I think, you know, it could be, could be correct. Ultimately, we don't know. So we have to just kind of take a guess. We're, we're trying to piece things together. But, you know, I think it's, it's not, a, not a bad way to look at it. So in this hour, do you, think, do you think Mary, in her persistence, forced the hour? <sighs> sort of um you know sort of you know he, he wasn't it, it wasn't necessarily the time that he was going to do it but in his incredible pack you know well not just passion but his compassion that's what i'm looking for he uh he did this this wonderful thing you know for his mother and for the guests uh out, out of a sense of mercy mm -hmm. so you know it, there doesn't seem to be anything in the text that john's like hey check it out it's moses right I mean, I don't really get that sense that they're like, oh my goodness, water to wine. Could that be most? I mean, maybe they were thinking that, you know, but I don't know. So, okay. All right. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, question Do you have a resource that teaches all about all the different feasts and how to understand them? Well, I don't have a particular resource for that i've done well i might have done something uh i think it's called the fall feast uh the fall feast prophetically fulfilled so i did that some years ago i think that's on my channel i've got over 2000 videos on my channel so i can't quite remember all that i have on there but um you know definitely check that out so um this is a question are the beast and the antichrist two different beings i would hold that they are exactly the same being uh, the antichrist is really a bit of a misnomer we're kind of stuck with it because we keep using it um so the bible doesn't really talk about the antichrist it talks about antichrists with an s that there you know are various people who are against christ and so they are anti-christ uh, you know but then we put a capital a on that when we talk about the beast the son of perdition the man of sin the lawless one uh, the little horn he's got lots of different names uh, so antichrist just becomes a, a collective catch-all phrase to talk about this individual that we think um, that, that we see coming um, in, in the, at the end of time so and a question from mark could you give a non-calvinistic explanation to ephesians 1 4 through 5 please of course i'm not a calvinist but i run into them occasionally and i'd like to have a better understanding so i can explain this uh explain it better all right non-calvinistic yeah he's non-calvinistic okay so um let me pull this up so everybody can see this all right um blessed be the father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him and love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. All right, so this is definitely a tricky one. All right, and it took me a long time to understand this. All right, but if you go through the book of Ephesians, you'll see that there are two principal pronouns that Paul is using. He's talking about us, we, and he's talking about you, All right? so. He, he talks about us, we, the Jews, who were the first to believe. And then in chapter 2, he talks about you, once Gentiles, have now been brought into the commonwealth of Israel, into the covenant of the promises. You're no longer strangers, right? So that's um, th those are the two big takeaways. So Paul, in many of his, you know, his books, his letters, is trying to explain how these two different groups the Jewish people, the house of Judah, and the house of Israel, aka the Gentiles, or people where the where the house of Israel went was into the, the Gentiles, how they can become one again. And 
Um, now, Calvinists, having been rather divorced from this idea of these two houses, um, started to apply a lot of these things to the so-called church. Okay, so, you know, just as he chose us in him, who did God choose? He chose Israel, right? He chose the United Kingdom of Israel. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 7, that he chose them to be his people. And God must have chosen them before the foundation of the world because God knew who he was going to choose, right? So, so that it, it just follows. So, you know, we have to go back to the earlier text to let them establish who was chosen. It was Israel. And then if we follow the story, we see that the United Kingdom of Israel under David broke into two kingdoms after Solomon. It became the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And then the northern kingdom of Israel fell into gross idolatry. And God finally said, that's it. We're done. You're not my people. Get out. And as she's packing her bags, he says, but one day I'll bring you back to me and I'll betroth you to me in righteousness. Right? He says this in Hosea. He says it in Jeremiah. He says it in Ezekiel. He says it in so many different places. So how does this all come together? Well, it's through Messiah. Messiah is the husband that married Israel back at Sinai. He's the husband that divorced Israel. And he's the husband that died for Israel. So that the, the 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 law of divorce could be washed away, and all the obligations and stains and bad things that happened as a result of her being wayward were also washed away, and now she can come back as a pure, spotless virgin. All right. So that's in a nutshell. That's how it all comes together. Um, but it, it takes a lot of time to figure out, you know, how this all comes together. Okay. So I'm I'm giving you the nut the nutshell version uh, to try to put all this together for you. So let me just jump in there real quick on one thing. Uh, was that uh, Mark? Was it? Yes. Mark J. That asked the question. Mark, uh, let me just give you a little tip on something that helped me years ago in how to read my Bible. Uh, if you could if you could embrace this uh, with all of your heart, all your mind, just embrace this. The Bible from cover to cover from Genesis to Revelation is predominantly, mostly, all about Israel and their relationship with God from cover to cover. Now, I know, just like you know, and everyone watching knows, we all love to insert ourselves into these scriptures. We like to in insert our church or our lives as Christians into these verses. And when Paul uses words like us and you and we, those those particular pronouns um, in, in the book of Ephesians, we want to automatically assume, oh, he's, he's talking about me. He's talking about the Christian church today. That's going to really mess up how you understand your Bible. So if you can just embrace the fact that all of this in the scriptures, like I said, from one cover to the other, it's all about the Israel of God. Um, and that's the that's what Paul used in Galatians 6, 16. He used that, he put that the in between the before the word Israel. So Israel goes after the cross, goes from being a genuine people of God to the Israel of God, which now includes the Gentiles who have faith in, in Yeshua. They become part of the Israel of God. But just remember that one little thing. I think it will help you a lot. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, we have a few questions here in the chat. So we'll get to these and then we'll call it a day. Uh, Virginia says, what are your thoughts on the possibility of the very short tribulation, such as one year as proposed by Stephen Tria of Torah family? Um, so I had him on my show some years ago. And I think, you know, he he presents well. Uh, I, I was not convinced because I just don't know how to get around what seem to be very clear numbers, in my opinion, you know, it talks about um, 1,260 days for the the ministry of the two witnesses. And then it's followed by 1,260 days that the time that the Antichrist is going to have his uh, his his turn. OK, now, I think what Steve, to be fair to him, um, I hope I'm 
you know, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I've understood his uh, thing, is that the time will be cut short. Um, and so he says, you know, maybe it would be less than 1,260 days. What I would suggest, the way I read that, is that, no, it's going to be 1,260 days regardless, okay? Um, and what is cut short is that instead of it going on for, you know, say 5,000 days or, you know, 10,000 days or forever, you know, because that is the goal of the Antichrist is to live forever and to do his thing and to never have to face consequences. You know, it's sort of like the thousand year Reich. Um, that was the plan from Satan or from, you know, well, Satan and Hitler's perspective. Uh, but God certainly cut it short. All right. Um, and it all ended, you know, um, sometime in April of 1945. So even though the enemy wanted it to go on, God's like, no, I don't think so. So that's what I would suggest. So we know that the timing will be 1260 days, but that in and of itself is God cutting it short. And had God not cut it short or limited it to 1260 days, then it would have gone on. Well, who knows how long indefinitely. Okay. So that's what I would suggest. And I, the numbers seem very clear. I don't know how you can get around it. You know, it's, you know, it says 1260 days, 42 months, time times and half a time. You know, you got three different time stamps telling you how long this great time of tribulation or time of great tribulation or Jacob's trouble is going to go on. I just don't know how to get around that. So, you know, I, I, I certainly appreciate Steve Mutri and I think he's done some some really good studies. Uh, I, I would disagree with him uh, on this particular topic. So um, another question for Virginia. Do you believe that Israel was established as a nation, even though some say it isn't because it was established by ungodly people. Are either of those claims justified? Well, um, you know, Ed, feel free to jump in. I, no. I think that Israel is very much a nation um, established by God, ultimately. But God can use ungodly people. I mean, look at Nebuchadnezzar, bad guy. OK, but God calls him his servant. Um, and eventually, Nebuchadnezzar does become a believer in God. But initially, when he goes and does God's work of destroying Jerusalem, he's not at all even remotely a believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He could care less. Uh, so, And yet God used him to do that work. So that's what I would suggest is that you know God can use the ungodly to accomplish his good and godly ends. And, um, you know, whether, you know, I mean, I've, I've read these things, you know, to the degree that the Illuminati and all this stuff were involved. We know the Rothschilds were involved. Uh, can God move in the heart of uh, an unrighteous person? I think he can do that. You know, God seems to be pretty good at that. So I, I don't think that's a problem at all. I mean, look at what he did with Pharaoh, right? He says, I'm going to, I'm going to work through you, Pharaoh, and you're going to, I'm going to be glorified through you. Thank you. Right. So, you know, if God can do that with Pharaoh, he can do it with Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure he can do it with a few Illuminati banker types. Uh, I don't think there's any problem at all. Yeah. And Deuteronomy 9, you know, kind of answers that question. He didn't choose the people of Israel because they were anything special. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, we have to. He has to work. If he didn't work through ungodly people. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Where would we be? I know. I know. Um, Darlene says, my loved ones that have passed and know and love Jesus, where are they now? All right. Well, this is an age old question. You know, <laughs> are, are they up with the Lord currently sort of enjoying the nuptials of heaven or are they asleep? And, you know, I, I, I waffle a little bit on this because I think you can make a pretty decent argument for either in scripture. Paul talks about how to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's pretty cool. OK. And yet Jesus talked about, uh, you know, people that would were, that had fallen asleep. Daniel was said that he was told that he would sleep until the time of the end, until the time of the resurrection. Uh, you know, I, Isaiah talks about those who sleep in the dust and they will be resurrected. That's the time of the resurrection. That's, you know, just, I don't know, moments or whatever minutes um, at the time of when Jesus comes, you know, so we're after the tribulation. That is the time of the resurrection that says that they've been sleeping. So we have that. But then we also have this interesting thing in the book of Revelation where there's a bunch of souls underneath the altar. And they're like, how much longer? You know, they're like, just a little bit. 
and you know, you'll get this 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 new garment that you get to wear. So, you know, this is where I, I think we can't get too dogmatic on this question. But here's what I take comfort in. You know, so let's say, you know, well, I hope I live, but, uh, you know, I could die at any time. Uh, the moment that I die, guess what? My brain activity stops. There's no consciousness. I'm not aware of anything because I'm dead. Okay. Now, let's assume that I'm just sleeping or whatever you want to call that dead. Okay. The moment that I'm resurrected, how much time will have passed? Probably a lot. But from my perception, it will be just closing my eyes. It's only closing your eyes. I think that's pretty cool. You yeah. know, so there's really no sense of time at all. Yeah. So what difference does it really make ultimately? I would rather probably experience that than be one of those souls stuck under the altar and saying, how much longer, you know, are we there yet? And because, um, <laughs> you know, when you're dead and you're not conscious, then you have zero capacity to worry about it or say, you know, is it, are we done yet? You know, you don't care because you're not thinking, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not conscious. I've and, put it this uh, way many times, Doug. It's like, uh, you know, people... People want, I personally think it's sleep, just for the record. And the reason I think it's sleep is for all the reasons that you just mentioned, all the scripture that talks about it sleeping. Uh, just because Paul says what he says about being absent from the body to be with the Lord, doesn't necessarily mean that as soon as you are absent from the body, you are with the Lord. Nor does it mean that after you die, you aren't still with the body, so to speak. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of, inference that people take out of that passage of scripture mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there is this concept of a twinkling of an eye there is this concept of immediate realization so someone who lived in moses's day mm. they've been gone three thousand years or longer you know 3500 mm. years it'll still feel like they just died the moment their eyes awaken to the resurrection mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's like having a really good night's sleep at night you go to bed 10 hours later you wake up and all you remember is falling asleep. Yeah. That was 10 hours ago. But to you, it was like that. Yeah. When you're dead, you are you kind of slip outside of time and, and space. So it doesn't matter how long you're dead. It's not like you're laying there in sleep, just slumbering and dreaming. And you got 5,000 years or 2,000 years or 1,000 years of just nothingness. No. It's death and awaken. Yeah. And that time could be a day for you it could be a thousand years for you but in our minds we will die and immediately awake yeah which is a pretty good deal when you think about it yes. <laughs> it's we we were alive we have that perception of time and it seems like it's a long time but when you're dead you won't sense it at all right so that's the upside of death i guess <laughs> there's such a thing oh man well awesome brother ed thank you uh as always for helping us get through these questions. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone out there. Hey, if you want to be a, a producer of the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Doug Ham. I give as little as much as you want. It really does help. Thank you. You know, think of it like taking me out for a cup of coffee or something like that. Um, definitely check out Brother Ed's stuff. Um, you know, check out the Ancient Paths book, uh, which is really an excellent book. So I encourage everyone to check that out. And Join us on Thursdays because we're going to have Prophecy Roundtable and then uh, Saturdays for the uh, Shabbat teaching. So God bless you guys. Take care and we will see you next time.